All right, um, <clears throat> let's go ahead and get started here tonight. Thank you guys so much for being here. Uh, it's so good to see all of y'all. And uh, let me just say kind of on the front end uh, to set expectations uh, as low as possible um, that, you know, we're going to talk about a lot of things with the cell phones and things around it, but <clears throat> this is not going to be uh, comprehensive. All right, this, uh, this field is massive and there's things that are going on uh, currently. You know, I was on a website uh, earlier that was tracking websites that were being built and it, the number was just going up repeatedly. Uh, we're up to almost 2 billion uh, websites in the world uh, right now. <clears throat> and so it's just an ever-growing field. And so we're going to answer, hopefully, a lot of your questions, but uh, definitely not all of them. And we're going to try at the very end to have a QA and a time for things that maybe we don't touch on uh, that hopefully we can give you some insight uh, into uh, at large. But um, to start, I thought it would be good for us to, to play a little game. All right, there's, uh, there's some prizes involved. We got uh, some questions uh, that are involved in the timeline of technology. All right, if you can answer correctly, uh, you get a $10 gift card to Starbucks. All right, so there is, uh, you cannot use your phone from memory, <laughs> from memory or from thought. Uh, a lot of these questions, you'll, you'll understand a little bit uh, when we get into it. All right, so how many websites were available in 1993? All right, so I just told you there's 2 billion websites in the world uh, currently. How many websites were there in 1993? Okay, zero, no. Four. Four. Hundred. We'll, we'll, ta we'll, ta we'll take hundred as the answer. 130. All right, 130 uh, websites in the world in 1993, uh, which is crazy to think about how exponentially that's grown uh, in what seems like a short amount of time. Right? If you think about what you were doing in 1993, um, it doesn't seem that long ago. Uh, then, oh, goodness. All right. The next question. What year, <laughs> you may remember this. I hope you remember this because it was just phenomenal. Uh, did the 3D animated clip, The Dancing Baby, come on the scene? All right. Remember, there was this weird baby in a diaper dancing to a song, Uga Shaka, uh, over and over again that everyone in the world saw during that time. 95 is close. 96. It was 96. Who said 96? <laughs> there you go. 1996. Who was it? Who was the closest? No. <laughs> All right. So uh, the next question. When was the search engine Google born? 99 is a good guess. Close. 98. 1998, Google was born. All right, so, you know, 20, 21 years ago, uh, 22 years ago, you couldn't say Google, you know, that I'm Googling something. Like, that's just insane, right? We can't even imagine a world uh, like that. Netflix began in 1997. What was their service? DVDs. What'd they do with it? They mailed them, right? They mailed... If you told your student right now that Netflix mailed DVDs, there is no way they would believe you. Like, there's no way. Uh, there's no way that they would believe that that's what Netflix did. Uh, obviously, they're a streaming service uh, now. In 2001, a federal judge shut down what major music service? <laughs> yeah. Yes. That was it. Uh, that was it. And be honest. Be honest. How many of you had a Napster? How many of you thought that the FBI was going to break in and arrest you? Huh? Huh? It was an like ongoing fear uh, at all times. Uh, we were convinced that that was going to happen. What year was the first iPhone released? No. It was 2000. Higher 2007. That's it. Oh, you already got one. All right. Well, hey, there you go. There you go. All right. So... <clears throat> Technology has, has been an ever-changing thing. Most of us have been uh, born and alive during this, this time frame. I think all of us have, uh, in, in which we have seen some of this go on. I, I talked to uh, people. I can remember the first time I got a text message, um, and it was this weird, crazy thing. You know, it said, hey, what's up? And I was like, 
I don't know, you know, <laughs> what is up? And, uh, and then uh, the first shocking uh, cell phone bill that we got whenever, <laughs> whenever those got discovered, do you remember that? Uh, it was like a $1,000 phone bill, you know, because each text was 10 cents. This idea of unlimited text, message, text messaging was, was not there. Uh, we certainly couldn't get on the internet from our phone. We played Snake, uh, all of those things like that. There was a flip flown, <laughs> flown, a flip phone uh, and different things like that. It was so many different, uh, it was so different for us than it is for them. I can remember going to a library to work on homework. Uh, I can remember having a family computer uh, that was in a centralized location where we would go to if we wanted to get on the internet and that amazing noise that it made as it connected through dial-up, right? Uh, all of those things were what we grew up with and what we saw early on. And your student is growing up in a world that's very, very different than that. Very different from that. That they can access uh, those, they could have accessed the entire internet in 1993 in a day. Like 130 websites wouldn't even be a problem. Uh, they, could, they could go through that entire thing. And so uh, the, the amount of information and the things that they are dealing with is huge. It's huge, and uh, really, if we think about it, we're in the midst of a large-scale uh, social experiment, and our children are the source of that experiment, all right? We're growing up in a time and a frame where no one knows what the end result's going to be of giving these kids this technology, giving them their cell phones and tablets. Are they going to be smarter? You know, are they going to be able to do things quicker? Uh, no one really knows. All that we have are some of the information that we're getting back through some research, and a lot of it is pointing towards some dangerous things. All right, they're pointing towards some dangerous things. And if we're not vigilant in this area of cell phones and iPad and usages, usage in that, we may look up years from now and wonder what has happened, right? Like, like what's, what's gone wrong? And so that's really what we want to address here tonight is just, okay, what, where are things going? All right, and if we don't step in as parents, uh, where is that going to take our kid? And then what if on the other side, we do engage what could be, all right, what could be the future? So here's the thing about cell phones. Um, they're not going anywhere, right? Like, like you're, you can not give your kid a cell phone now, uh, but whenever they get out of high school, they're going to get a cell phone. They need one uh, to function in society today. And the cell phone itself is not evil, right? The, the cell phone isn't evil. It's the the things that come along with it. It's the freedom that's there, all right? So uh, we have to understand that the issue isn't cell phones. It's the ability that the cell phones can produce if left unchecked. And so I just want to read real quick Romans 1 uh, to, to remind us a little bit about just the natural state of our hearts. Because at the end of the day, uh, our hearts play a huge part in all of this. And so here's what <clears throat> Romans 1 says about what's going on uh, for, for people. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, uh, they exchanged God uh, for images. They exchanged God for things that they could see, things that they could do. Uh, God gave them over to their debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliceness. <clears throat> they are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents. Can I get an amen, right? Um, <clears throat> foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless, though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And that is the natural state of our heart. Right, apart from the Holy Spirit, apart from, from Christ's intervention in our life and salvation that can bring uh, a freedom of our mind and the ability to understand godly things and holy things and walk in holiness and all of those things, the natural posture of our heart is for evil. And we see this in all inventions throughout history. Right, it doesn't matter what it is. I was uh, thinking the other day about the first camera, like ch -ch camera, uh, that they had the giant bulb and the flash went off. You know, it was an amazing invention. Oh, and what is one of the first things that they start to do with it? Right, they take pictures of ladies of the night. 
if we understand what I'm saying there. Yeah, um, that was one of the first things that they did. Whenever uh, internet became, the first things that they start to do is think about how we can satisfy these different longings that come from a sinful place naturally in our lives. And so that is one of the biggest things that going on, that's going on. So here's where we're going to start. What is the problem? All right, what is the problem that we're seeing? And so we're going to get a lot of statistics here. We're going to get a lot of stats of things that are going on. Uh, a lot of them scary. Uh, a lot of them probably difficult to hear. Uh, all of those things. But uh, I just think that it's good for us to get our, our minds around a little bit. Some of you may have heard some of these before. It's all good. But remember, it's not the phones that are evil, right? It's the natural posture of our heart and the access that's given in it. At the end of the day, it's the usage by the owner and the amount of time and investment that comes with phones that leads to evil. And left to their own devices, teenagers will abuse cell phones, right? And they will take them to unhealthy levels. They just will. They'll do that with anything. It's not just cell phones. If you leave your kid unchecked in uh, video games, they'll play video games all day. Right? If you leave them unchecked with watching TV, they're going to watch TV all day. They don't know how to not. It's just who they are as little teenagers is that they want and they consume and they want to feel. And, and so they do it to excess. It doesn't really matter what it is. And, and all of you have a story that you could tell about your student in that arena. Phones are no different in any of that. But here's some of the problems <clears throat> that begin to come out with cell phones. Studies suggest that excessive online activities is linked to sleep, learning, social, and psychological and focus disorders. All right, so it's beginning to produce in teenagers and in students um, some of these things around it, as well as violence. They're starting to see more violent come out of this. And so that's a, that's a huge red flag. On the low end, about 75% of teens have smartphones. All right, that's a very generous number. Uh, so three-fourths of students have cell phones and a smartphone that can access the Internet and anything else uh, that's along with that, which in turn means they have access to the Internet. Cell phone usage, they can intervene with sleep cycles. Uh, they diminish their sleep time and poor quality in their sleep. It it, the cell phone itself, like if your student has a cell phone in their bed, a tablet in their bed, uh, it, it, it brings out a light. It's called blue light is what they call it, and it blocks the transmitter uh, in them that, that produces melatonin. And so they have an inability to, to sleep at night. It's, it's causing them to not sleep. And that's just from a physical side of it, not to put into to, to the works the psychological side of it, where they have this FOMO, this fear of missing out on what's going on somewhere else. <laughs> you know, like someone's doing something somewhere and I need to know what it is. And they all have it, that anxiety and that tension that's there. And they have to look and they have to look and they have to look. And so uh, it's just... Uh, a thing that's destroying sleep cycles. And we all know, right, whenever you're raising your kid uh, early, early on, how important sleep cycles were, right? Uh, I'm living that life right now. My entire life is sleep cycles. I got a three-month-old. That's all that it is. All day, every day. How much has he slept today? When did he go to sleep? When's he going to wake up next? We need to prepare for that over and over and over again. And if he's not getting enough sleep, well, things are going bad. He's not going to sleep later. He's not sleeping now. And it just keeps going on and on. And the same is true for your uh, teenager, they need sleep. They need good sleep. Maybe just as much now as they did then, because uh, they're still forming their brain. <laughs> their brain's still forming. They're still developing, and they still need all of those things. And so that's a huge deal that might seem minor whenever we get to the rest of it. But the lack of sleep is producing uh, poor test scores. It's producing uh, poor activity, attention, focus. They're falling asleep in class. All of those things are byproducts of that. All right, so that's a huge deal. Most teens are on their phones from five to eight hours a day. All right, so that's a huge amount. If you have an iPhone, uh, you can actually look at this. Um, you go into your settings. We'll talk about this in a minute. And you can see screen time. A and in there, it tells you how much time you've spent viewing your cell phone. Uh, so for me today, uh, I've spent an hour and 42 minutes uh, looking at my phone in some capacity. 
Um, and so I think that's pretty good. That's not bad, right? Yeah. Hey. <laughs> um, and what's interesting about that is it breaks up what you've viewed as well. So social networking, uh, work type stuff, email, it breaks it down for you. We'll get into that in a little bit. But students are on it five to eight hours a day. And you think, man, that's so excessive. How is that even possible? But, but you have to remember it's all the time. All right, it's all the time. It's in school. It's in bed at night. It's when they go to the bathroom. It's while they're talking to each other in all places all the time. They, they have ac- access to it, and they'll be talking to someone with their phone, you know, and they'll be not really talking to the person there, but standing in the proximity of someone and considering that, talking to them and going through their phone and going through what they're, what's going on and texting someone who's not standing there, uh, right there beside them. And so smartphones and social media, getting back into the physical, it actually activates the same brain centers as things like gambling, sex, eating, exercise, and other addictive behaviors. All right, so the same location of the brain that activates all of those things uh, activates uh, whenever we use our cell phones and whenever we're on social networking sites. And so what does that mean? It means that there's a dopamine that's released in the center of the brain uh, that produces a sense of comfort and, uh, and almost like a high. So if, you're, if someone's doing drugs, one of the things that happens is the dopamine spikes. It's released in their brain at an excessive rate, and it gives them this sense of uh, happiness and joy. Like if um, they, they're on top of the world, they get small quantities of that over and over again in their life as they open up their phone and as they get onto social media and do those things. It's a reward center in their brain, just like with gambling, just like with sex and eating and exercise. It delivers this constant reward to them that's hard to match by anything else in their life. Like, nothing else produces it at that kind of rate with them where they're able to do it consistently. And so the behavior is understood as habitual drive. Those things, you know, sex, drinking, drugs, um, gambling, those things create compulsion, right? Like it creates a compulsion that's there that I need to, to do that again. Like if you're gambling and you give a certain amount, you know, and you bet a certain amount, <laughs> give a certain amount, like I've been gambling, you can tell, right? Uh, like you bet a certain amount, you know, the next time you come to it, you want to bet more. That's how come people can lose their entire household money in a gambling situation because they don't have that self-control there because what's happening is it eliminates the, the negative consequences in their brain for the dopamine fix that they're getting. And I think that you can probably imagine, okay, whenever we put cell phones into that equation, what are some things that can start to happen? And we'll get into that in in a little bit. But the result, our kids are experiencing self-esteem and confidence issues while lacking the social interaction and the ability to communicate with others in a way to, to fix that. All right, so instead of engaging a neighbor or a friend or a classmate in person, it's easier for them to get out their phone and get a dose of dopamine from, from whatever they're looking at on social networking. Like you would get that in an interaction with someone else. Think about your relationship with your significant other. You know, like being in their presence, you know, being near, having intimacy with them creates that dopamine effect in your life. But that's much harder and much more hard work than it is to open up a phone and scroll. Right, and so with these students, instead of getting this interaction with another person or group of friends where they're able to have, you know, this understanding and warmness and welcomeness with each other, uh, they get it from their phones in a quicker, more instant gratification sort of way. And so they're not developing the type of friendships that they need to, to produce. And because of that, their self-esteem and their confidence starts to go down. They're unable to, to have the type of levels of that that they need. And so uh, as a result of all of that, forcibly removing teens from that world, like if you go in and you took your kid's phone and was like, you can't have this back and walk, right, walk away, what is their reaction? <laughs> Anger, they lash out, there's what? 
Right, it's real similar to a drug addict. Uh, That's exactly what it is. It shows symptoms. uh, Forcibly removing teens from online networks and phones has shown to trigger symptoms that are normally associated with drug, alcohol, and nicotine withdrawal. They're so addicted uh, to this thing because it's giving them something to keep them going that whenever it's taken away from them, there's a physical ramification that goes into it. And it's just like being addicted to, to anything else. I remember the first time I saw this was uh, in Texas. I, I had a group of students who were going on a trip. Uh, I made them take up all their phones because this was at the day and time where not everyone had a phone and you could know who had a phone and who didn't. And this girl was visibly just upset and like shaking at the thought of not having her phone. And I remember turning to Andrea and being like, this is a problem. <laughs> like, like, this is a situation. I don't, I don't even know what to deal with this. And what's amazing is, you know, two days later, three days later, she's a different kid, right? She's a different kid. It's like she's gotten off of that, just like uh, in, in nicotine dr- or alcohol or drug use, they start to come off of that, and it starts to regain some balance in their life. And she was a different person altogether. And so that's a, that's a huge part of this is the physical nature in which it's changing our children. It's changing them. And if we're not careful, then we, we, we don't know where that's going to take them in the future. Uh, another big part, there's popularity contests, right? All of us experienced that growing up. Uh, you were the biggest, you were the strongest, you played on the team, uh, you had this certain group of friends, you sat at the right lunch table, <laughs> whatever that looked like in your school. Uh, there was a popularity contest. Now, uh, it's played out online. It's played out online for a lot of your students, and it revolves around how many likes or followers you have. And uh, it's a way to place your social status. Like, where do I fit in to the social status of everything going on is how many people uh, I have that follow me or how many people like my post. You know, if I post this and no one likes it, then I'm shamed, you know, and, and I feel awful and, and, the, and I'm not uh, up to uh, other people's standard. And as an effect of that, research shows that eighth graders' risk of depression jumps 27% when he or she frequently uses social media. All right, so an eighth grader who's using social media on a frequent basis, her likelihood of depression goes up 27% just because she's actively engaging with social media because of the way that she's being viewed, uh, because of where she's putting her identity. There's a whole litany of things that are involved in that, but it's huge, right? It's huge for them. As a result of that, kids who use their phones at least three hours a day because of those effects are more likely to be suicidal. More likely to be suicidal. Teen suicide rate in the U.S. right now is more than homicide rate. There are more teens that are taking their own life uh, than there are uh, people being killed. And that's a, that's a huge, teenagers being killed. Uh, that's a huge deal. It's a huge deal that, that is an epidemic and a problem in our society, and you know this, like, like we see it on the news, uh, we see it play out, and, and here's what I don't want you to hear whenever I say that, that if your kid looks at social media, then they're going to think about committing suicide. Like, that's, that's not what I'm saying, but he, here is what I'm saying. It opens up the chance, right? It, it opens up the door a little bit, that left unchecked, unguarded, that it opens up the gateway for that. It's just like anything else. If someone uh, was to smoke marijuana, it doesn't mean they're going to be a meth head, but it opens up the door, right? It opens up the door to take that next step, to take that next step because of all that's going into this. And so uh, that's, that's playing out. Depression is a huge deal in our culture right now, huge, and not just with students, right? not just with students, all over our culture. And as a result of that, the option has been made normalized in our society to take your own life. And we see it on uh, movies, we see it on TV, you see it on Netflix, you see it in the paper, you see it on Instagram, you see it all over the place all the time. And so we're actually talking about depression uh, and those things next week on Wednesday night. So bring your students. Uh, So we can talk about that uh, with them. But it's a huge huge issue. 
And then, of course, uh, one of the biggest issues that teens struggle with uh, involving their phones is pornography. Is pornography. It's a huge, huge issue. Massive. I don't think that we can even wrap our minds around how huge of an issue this is uh, in our culture, especially in our students, but in our culture at large. Um, and here's the other side of that. I was doing this research. It's just so heartbreaking. Um, it's not just porn, though. It's also sexting. Um, at least one in four teens are receiving sexually explicit texts and messages. All right, 25% of, of teens are doing that. And, and I'll say that in these, the statistics that we're about to go through involving pornography, these are from a couple of years ago. So, so I'm anticipating this is higher. All right, these are all very generous. So as shocking as they may be, this is the low end uh, of, of it. And so one in four are doing that. One in seven are sending them. All right, one in seven are sending those types of messages uh, to other sexually explicit text um, and pictures. More than one in 10 are forwarding those. All right, so not only are uh, our students sending pictures, receiving them, but then they're forwarding them to someone else, which if you're wondering, there's precedence, that's, that's this distribution of child pornography, you know, if they're under 18 years old and, and can be accountable to that. It, it's a huge, huge deal for that. Uh, more than one in 10 are forwarding without consent and uh, sexting in 2016, so this is two years ago and two months, um, was the sixth top ranked issue in the list of health concerns for U.S. children. So out of the biggest health concerns for children in the United States, uh, sexting was number six on that list. All right, so that's a, I mean, that's massive. And, and if the world is seeing that as a problem, uh, us inside the church definitely need to see, hey, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. And, it, and, it, and <clears throat> it's hard for us to, to grasp because we didn't grow up in that world. Like the pictures that we took were with disposable cameras. Uh, the pictures that were around my house uh, were pinned on the wall after I printed them off at Walgreens. And, and they have pictures constantly on their phone. They're taking photos all the time, all the time. And it's nothing to push send. It's nothing. It's so easy. It's so easy to do. And whenever you're in this depressed place where you're seeking acceptance and someone's asking you for something, and you can get a dopamine fix by doing it, the natural step is to step into that. Unless there's guardrails, right? Unless there's things in place to help show that that's not the way. So now, porn itself, uh, in 2016, one of the biggest porn hubs uh, is a site called Pornhub, and it says that its users watched 4.6 billion hours of pornography. 4.6 billion hours of pornography in a year. One site. One site. Not, not all of the sites. One site registered that much. Mind-blowing. 61% of that was done through a smartphone. Was done through a smartphone. All right? Not, not a computer. Uh, not the way that, that you may think about it whenever you were growing up. Like, from a phone... 61% of that was accessed that way, and 11% through a tablet. All right, so an iPod, uh, iPad, whatever the tablet is, anything that has internet access that they can carry around. All right, that's huge numbers, huge numbers that that's where that's coming from uh, within that. In 2015, Bound to be more today, nine out of ten boys and six out of ten girls are exposed to pornography online before 18. All right, 90% of guys, 60% of girls. The fastest growing uh, industry in pornography, the biggest field where they're experiencing the most growth is through females, through women. That's the fastest growing uh, part of pornography. And the guy side, I mean, I, I've, I've seen stats that 97%, 98% uh, have been exposed to porn in some way by the time they graduate, by the time they're 18. Um, just huge, huge numbers uh, for that. Here's the, 
devastating side of that, uh, the first exposure for boys is 12 years old on average. On average, right? So that means younger, some older, but on average in 2015 was 12. Uh, I would say it's at least probably down to 11 now, if not younger than that, that are getting their first exposure uh, to pornography. 83% of boys and 60% are exposed to things like group sex. Uh, 70 and five, 70 and 55% are exposed to same sex. Uh, 71% have done things to hide their online activity. Uh, just the things that we see manifested in culture, they're getting access to at 12 years old, 13 years old, 14 years old. Things that, that we would have a hard time understanding and grasping, they're having in their hands at 13 years old. And then having to make a decision about that. Most, uh, I, I don't, most, a high percentage, however you want to say this, um, people that walk into uh, same-sex marriages, same-sex attraction, all of those things, uh, the initial uh, push is in pornography. The initial thing that, that gets lodged in there is through pornography. And um, here's, here's the other side that's just as devastating. 30%, 30 so one-third, uh, are exposed unintentionally. They're not even looking for it, right? They're not even going out looking for it. A friend says, hey, look at my phone. And now that's locked <laughs> in their brain, right? They've seen it. They can't unsee it. Uh, they get an email. They get a, a message on, on Instagram. Whatever it is, they open it up, and all of a sudden, they've seen something that then takes root in their heart. And it was unintentional. They weren't searching for it. Here's the reality, and we know this, man. It's the, it's the work of the enemy. It's the work of the devil. Uh, all of those things that, that you don't have to go searching for those things. They will come searching for you <laughs> and these teenagers. I can remember as a 16-year-old boy driving down the road with a friend, and we're just driving down the road. We're, not, we're minding our own business. We see something out in a field. We lived in the country put it in park, go, what's laying out in the field? A pornographic magazine. I wasn't searching for that. Like, what are the chances that that would be out there? And all of a sudden, now we have access to it as 16-year-olds. Like, that is not something that was just on my mind, like we were going to do this. And the same is true for many of your students. But once it's there, once it's seen, it starts to take root. And it can become a huge issue in their life. The numbers, uh, like I said, are for three or four years ago. And I would say it's gone up sust substantially. Like they're going to be higher um, than this. And so as you can see, there's a huge situation on our hands, right? Like, like all of that's to, to set some gravity to what, uh, what we're talking about here. Essentially, we're inviting into our homes many of the things that we would forcibly fight against. Right? Like we would forcibly fight against all of those things, yet in our culture, things like that live in our kids' pockets and lay on their nightstands. You know, it's just that, that, that's where we're at with this. And so uh, the big question is why can't we stay here? I think it's fairly obvious, but why can't we stay here? I think that if we were to, to play this out, all right, let's say uh, not knowing any of your situations with your kids and their phones and, and what that looks like, but let's say, um, as many parents do, uh, you've just given your kid a phone and said, hey, here you go, Merry Christmas, Happy Birthday, you got a new phone, uh, it's going to be great, you know, be sure to stay on the good stuff, uh, and that's just kind of it, and they get their phone, and they go, and they charge it up, and they have it from that point on. You know, they, they have their phone, and they're texting, and they're searching, and they're doing all those things. And many of the statistics that we just looked at become a reality for them, right? There, there's no uh, checkup. There's no uh, guardrails. We don't know how to do that. We don't know what it looks like. <clears throat> what's going to end up happening to our kids? Um, what's going to end up happening to their generation? And I think that, that what we're going to see are some very specific things that come out of it. Uh, a generation of, of kids who waste time, uh, who are addicted to, 
to their phones, desensitized to sexual things, violence, and, and view people differently than what God intended. All right, so let's just paint this picture real quick. <laughs> what does this look like 10 years from now, 15 years from now, when, when our kids are 25, 30 years old, as they're wasting time and addicted to their phone? Well, they'll be mindless, you know, consuming uh, only the things that, that are going to, to make them feel better, uh, not searching things out that are going to better them. In the things of Christ, it's going to lead to depression. They're not going to be engaging people on a personal level. Uh, they're going to be scrolling on their phones forever, and they're going to struggle. They're going to struggle in their jobs. They're going to struggle in school. They're going to struggle in their relationships. Like, that's just going to be the reality of their future if that's where they're at. If they're desensitized to sexual things, they're going to be in, in families that are broken, they're going to be in families that lead to divorce. There's going to be a lack of intimacy between a husband and a wife uh, that's just going to be there as they become exposed to pornography. And if that, <clears throat> because here's the, the great myth <laughs> that, that's there that whenever you get married, that goes away. You know, many of these teens think that. Like, once I get married, then that struggle is going to be gone. And, and the reality is, is that that's not true. It's not true. The, the reality is, is that that thing in your heart has taken root there. And the easy access of it trumps all of these other things. And so they're going to be easily accessing so many of that. So they're going to be lacking in intimacy, having divorces, bro broken families everywhere, and an exploration into known sin. Like they just are. They're going to explore into it. And so the things that we see played out in our culture all over the news will become a reality because it's just the natural next step. Violence, uh, the things that they see, the way that people are treated through a screen move into their life, right? The things that they see on a screen become their reality. And they start to see someone not as people, as God made them, they start to see them as objects that are just around them, that can be manipulated, that can be uh, put into uh, whatever place that they want them to be in, and they don't view them in that way. And out of that, they lash out. They can lash out easily. It's easy to do those things whenever that becomes your reality. And so the question is, is there a better way? Is there a better way? All healthy relationships come from guidelines and guardrails. All of them, all healthy relationships come from that. Our relationship with God has guardrails, right, to keep us from running into ditches in life. Our relationship with our significant other, with our spouse, is it has guardrails. You know, you're going to be married to one wife, you know, that, that you're going to take these vows, these guardrails in sickness and in health. Whatever that looks like, you have guardrails that keep you from running off into the ditch. In your relationship with your kids in every other area of their life, there's blocks, there's safeguards to keep them from hurting themselves. And so the, that same thing <clears throat> is true in this area. It helps put things in perspective whenever we have those guardrails that are there. So what if instead uh, your student was more intentional in their cell phone use. You know, like, like here's the, the big negative view in the future, but what if in the future uh, you step into that? Today, whenever you leave, uh, this month, this year, you start to just step into these things with your kids, and 10, 15 years from now, this is what their life looks like. They're more intentional with their cell phone use. Like they're not just getting on there for the sake of getting on there or finding fulfillment or finding life there, but it's something that they use as the phone was intended to as a tool, as a tool to be able to get. If you open your phone right now, like you have unbelievable tools on there, so many. You know, I can remember trying to get uh, somewhere with my dad and having to open a map uh, and, and that thing never folded up right, you know, the same way, and you couldn't get it in the glove box. You just end up shoving it in there, and it's sticking out uh, everywhere. Now, you can type it in your phone. You're there. Trying to do difficult math, you have a calculator on your phone. Um, all of these things are, are there. I, I can talk to my parents who live in, in Fort Worth, Texas. They can see my grandkids anytime they want. Not my grandkids, their grandkids. Uh, <laughs> I look old, I'm not that old. Uh, uh, but, but they can see them whenever they want. And, and we can communicate with missionaries on the other side of the world. 
in an instant. We can talk to them face to face. You know, we can open a translator and talk to someone and share the gospel with them and it'll be translated for them. Those are huge tools. So what if that's how they began uh, to see their life? What if we train them to view their phone as a tool rather than an end unto itself? Instead of that being the end of it, is whatever this says about me, what if it becomes a tool that it begins to, to do work in their life where they can do a, make a huge impact? Imagine a society that has a balance between online interaction and personal interaction, where your kid can have a conversation with someone, right? Like they can talk to someone face to face, and they also can, can encourage people through their phones, but they also see people that are around them and have compassion towards them, that care about them. Uh, that can see them, that your student could leverage technology and phones to impact society and expand the kingdom reach. Be huge. Yeah. Can you email that up to the yes, like that. absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> I will say, that. Yes, that they can expand their kingdom reach all over the world. They could send it. That they could do so much if they could learn to leverage that for good. But the only way they're going to get there is if we help them, right? If we help them, if we lean into it with it. So what if our students found their worth in things of God rather than things that their post says? If that's where they're finding their worth in life, it would be a huge thing. So how can we protect them? How can we protect our kids? This is, this is the, the nuts and bolts uh, of everything up to this point. You know, we saw the issue. If we don't act, what's going to come? What if instead we do step into it? This is, the, this is the hard part, right? This is where we have to step into it. Uh, this is where we have to do things, to adjust things, to, to be a little different than culture is in some of these areas. So there are some simple uh, common sense things that we can do to help protect our kids. All right, some simple, uh, simple ways that we can do. The most important thing that you can do as a part of this is first of all to set ex- expectations, all right? So if you haven't set expectations for cell phone usage, for what phones are, that's step one, all right? Before you buy your kid a phone, before you hand it over to them, there needs to be a list of expectations around it, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about um, as far as that. And the other is that you, and second, um, is that you have to open up a dialogue. You have to open up a dialogue. There has to be an open conversation around these things. Um, You may feel ill-equipped, and your kid will never admit it, but they need you in this. They need you in it desperately. And they need to know that you care. They need to know that you are a safe place, that they can go when these issues come up because they will. Right? None of us are going to escape that. We're going to run into an issue, maybe multiple issues. An issue to some of you may not be an issue for someone else in the room. Like it could be a much, I mean like, oh, that's all that it is? Well, you know, that's nothing. But for all of us, we're going to have that conflict and an issue that's there, and we have to begin an open dialogue now. Now, I just gave you the stats on pornography. There needs to be an open conversation around it. You know, whenever I talk to to guys that are in their college age, uh, young adults, like, the question isn't, have you viewed pornography? It's, when was the last time? All right? Like, like the expectation now is that you've viewed it at some point. The the question is, have you dealt with it beyond that? Right? And so, for your kid, the reality is is that it's going to come at some point. Now, who do you want them to talk to about that? All right? Hopefully, it's you. Your, your kid's small group leader, you know, that conversation that's there where they can get some good advice from a godly adult and not another fellow 13-year-old that says, oh, you saw that? Well, well look at this. You know, it takes it a whole nother level uh, of things that are going on. And so we, we have to open up a dialogue, and, and, and it has to, and this is hard, like I get this part, it has to be a safe place. It has to be a safe place. It can't be, oh my goodness, I can't believe you looked at that. It can't be that. 
as much as you want to be that, <laughs> you know, as much as that moment, whenever that comes up, you're going to want to whip their tail. Uh, that's the moment where you're going to have to not freak out on the outside, you know, maybe freak out on the inside. Just be like, well, tell me about it. You know, how did that make you feel? You know, how did that happen? Who is that friend? Who's this, who's this kid's parents? I'm going to call them. Then you freak out, right? Uh, but, but you just have that open dialogue where it's a safe place where they know, hey, if I tell my dad that this is something that I'm struggling with, he's going to help me. So some practical things uh, that you could do immediately whenever you leave here. All right, something that you can do immediately whenever you leave here and start this. Now your kid's going to love it. It's going to be great. They're just going to be so excited. They're going to be like, man, Mom, I'm so glad that you came uh, to this. Um, now, the first one, uh, I say that now. Uh, let's back up a little bit. This first one might be a little painful, uh, but we have to model appropriate cell phone use ourselves. All right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we have to model appropriate cell phone use uh, ourselves. Here's the deal. Your kids are watching you, right? Your kids are watching you, whether you think they are or not, and they get their cues from you. Um, and so we have to model what we want replicated. All right? You have to model uh, what you want replicated in your house. If, uh, if we are constantly on our phones, then our kids will be. If we have our phones at the table, they will model them restraint. They'll see it's possible. All right, they'll see it's possible. And this is hugely convicting, right? Uh, and, and me and my wife are dealing with it. I'm trying to get my watch time. You know, you have that on your, your uh, phone, whether you know it or not. We'll talk about that in a minute. But, you know, to get that to a, to a level that's good, that I feel like is a good number, which for me, I'm like this weird competitive nature in me. It's like every week, it's got to be a little bit lower. And if it's not there, then, you know, I'm upset about it. Um, in a competition between my wife, who's a fellow firstborn, um, to, to battle that out. But, you know, even with my, my young kids, uh, I, I notice, I notice uh, they'll watch, you know. And uh, especially for young kids, they, they need to see the expressions on your face to know what's going on. Right? They, they need to see, uh, oh, Papa's happy. Uh, oh, Papa's sad. Uh, you know, whatever it is that they see it. They see it on your face, and, and they, they just, they need it. They desperately need it. And if we're here, and they're here, it's going to be a problem. And so we have to, we have to get our eyes up, and we have to model that for them. Um, so that's the first one. Sorry about that. That's rough. Um, but... The other side of it, uh, we have to limit access <clears throat> and set routines and structures. Again, this is something you can do tonight. Uh, whenever you get home, uh, maybe I'll say something. You're like, hey, that's a good idea. Uh, here's, here's one that I think is absolutely critical. Uh, no cell phone use at bedtime. No cell phone use at bedtime. An easy way to do that is to not let them have a charger in their room. <clears throat> All right? Don't let them have a charger in their room. Uh, make them charge it in your room or in another designated safe area that you know they're not going to be able to access. Uh, don't do it in the kitchen. They'll sneak in there and get it. Uh, a designated area that you know uh, that, that they're not going to, to get into and make them charge it in there. Uh, and, and they have no business having their phone in their room at night. All right? The, I cannot think of one. Uh, will they use it for their alarm? Yeah. Well, spin a quarter at Goodwill and get them an alarm clock <laughs> like it's worth it in the end um, that they had <laughs> alarm clock, right? Like that's, that's, uh, hadn't seen one of those in a while. Um, but I got a, I got a, God gave me an alarm clock, right? He gave me this three month old child that wakes me up every morning at just the perfect time for him um, to get up. But um, there's, no, there's no reason for them to have it in there. And, and, and we know this, man. Your parents probably told you the same thing that my parents told me. Uh, nothing good happens after 11 o'clock. You know, like, uh, there's no reason to be out that time. You need to be home. Uh, it's the same. Like, there's no reason to have your phone in there at that point in time. Uh, you're not going to be doing anything good. You're not going to be doing anything good at that time. If someone needs to text you or reach you at that point in time of the night, they're calling for a couple of reasons. All right, and, and we're adult enough to know what those are. 
There's no business uh, for them to have it uh, in there, in their room. And it's just going to lead to sleep regression. It's going to lead to so many different issues uh, along with that. Ain't that right, Andrew? Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> and so um, no reason. Keep it out of there. Um, the other thing uh, that, that you can do is have a de- designated time away from uh, the phone. And, and you can set that with whatever schedule you have, whatever that looks like for you. Uh, each family's different. You know, some of you have ball practice after school. Some of you have uh, these things that, that happen at certain times of the day. And so some of you homeschool, some of you uh, send your kids to school, um, all different areas that, that you have around you. And so um, what you have to do is figure out, okay, within our structure as a family, uh, what are some designated times that they can step away uh, from, their, from their phone? And so um, some, some instances, meals, you know, meals is, is one of those things. Just don't let them have their phone at the mealtime. Uh, you can talk to me. Let me know what's going on. I was telling uh, one of the parents earlier, one of the decisions that we made early on is like we weren't giving our kids uh, any type of electronic device whenever we go out to eat for dinner or we eat somewhere and do anything like that and we look around and all these other parents are doing it and their kids are just sitting there quietly and it's like, oh, sweet mercy, that would be amazing because uh, you can't talk to anyone and like one of them sticking, uh, it's just unbelievable uh, the amount of chaos that can ensue in that moment. Uh, but now, <laughs> a little bit later on down the road, like we get there and they sit down and they color and they talk to us and, and we get to eat a meal together as a family and it's not uh, all of those things. It was hard early on, but in the end, it was better. You know, it's better for them. It's going to be better for us. They're going to know how to do that, uh, the skill. So if they're on a business trip sometime and they're having to meet with someone, they don't sit down and pull out their phone and not be able to talk to them, uh, that they can actually communicate in that way. And so meal times is a huge one. Family time, uh, whatever that looks like for you. If you have a family devotional time, uh, do it without the phone in the room. Like, like, if you have a, a family movie night, like put the phones away. Uh, whatever that looks like for you, where you get together as a family, let it be about that. Who's in the room? It teaches them a big lesson uh, because what a lot of them don't understand is that the most important person that's around them are the people in the room, not whoever's on the end of their phone. Uh, a lot of times they'll be sitting across from someone and talking to someone over here and never engage that person. So it's huge uh, for them to, to uh, we teach them that in these little tiny things that we do. Homework, schoolwork, uh, all of those things designate time away from their phone. Be like, hey, when you're doing homework, before, how many of you have trouble getting your kid to school in the morning? Take them to school, difficult getting them to school in the morning. How about this? You don't get to get on your phone before school. Uh, you know, or maybe you can make an incentive like, hey, if you're ready by 630, you can get on your phone for 15 minutes. All right. So then they get down and brush your teeth, ready to go uh, so that they can get on their phone. Uh, a little reward at the end of that. But set up some guardrails, some times uh, for them and then stick to them. Stick to them. Uh, that's a huge part of it. And you can't just set them and then not, not follow through with it. Like have some, some consequences if they don't or if they do, uh, some rewards, different things like that. Uh, how about this? This is an, another one. Whenever you get home, get your kid's phone, uh, be on the same apps that they are. You may not understand them. I get it. I don't understand a lot of them. Go ahead and get on the app and follow them. Even if you have one follower, and it's your kid, uh, it's going to be amazing. They're going to hate it, and they're going to probably move to a different app, but you just keep going, right? Wherever it is that they go, you're there. Uh, Now, you don't have to hound them with it. Uh, You don't have to send them messages constantly uh, through the app or anything like that, but but just know about their activity. Uh, One of the things that that I've heard of parents doing is just having um, a rule where, like, as soon as I ask you for your phone, you have to give it to me. Like, like, no, I could ask for it at any moment of any day, at any time, and you have to hand it over immediately. And check the history, check whatever's going on, hand it back to them. Um, you know, maybe that's where you're at. I don't, I don't know. You know, just whatever feels right in your relationship with your student. You know, if they've messed up in some of these areas, I think you have some, some leverage to do that. You know, if, if your kid hasn't done those things up to this point, like you feel like they're in a good place, maybe that's not the step that you take, but just uh, fill it out as you go. Those are some easy, practical, you can do that tonight and make a difference in your student's life. All right, yes? Can you make it so that they cannot download any app? Yes, yes. 
Right. Yep. Uh, so that's what we're about to talk about. Some more involved safeguards uh, that you may have or you may see um, that, that, that can be beneficial for your kid is that you can place uh, protected things on smartphones. All right, password protected things. So uh, if you have an iPhone, uh, that's what I have. So I know kind of the process for that. I did a little research. You can do it on Androids. Uh, I don't know the buttons on Android, so I can't really explain it very well, but, but it would be easy. You can look that up and be able to figure that out. If you can't, uh, email me and I can give you some, some, some walks through that. But uh, you can put password protection uh, over different things uh, that your student can can look at. So uh, one of the things you can do is go into restrictions. Uh, you can turn off the Safari app so they don't have internet access. Uh, as far as going through a search browser like that, you can turn off app downloads. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Right. So it's a four digit. <laughs> it's a it's a four digit code. So um, they could guess it and different things, but you know you have some of that. Yes. I was just going to add to. So I work for technology companies. Mm-hmm. I know several other tech companies as well. So I've chosen in our family, we've got five kids, to use technology to our advantage. Mm-hmm. So I'm hardcore. Mm-hmm. Um, and then we also purchased the Disney Circle, which some people have heard of and some people are like, oh, it must be for preschoolers. It's literally just an internet toll center for your whole house. It's $99. Um, I got mine on Amazon. And then we pay $5 a month. Um, so it actually follows our kids no matter what internet they're on. Mm-hmm. Um, Yeah. Um, so, yeah, you can get in there in, in pretty much any app, anything like that. If there's certain apps that you know your student's struggling with, that this needs to be off for, for a period of time, uh, you can do that. You can be like, hey, turn it off in the restrictions. They can't access it uh, for until you put in the put in the code. And then uh, once you do, then they can get back on it. Uh, so that is definitely um, one. And like I said, that's in the search bar. You know, you pull down on your, your iPhone and it brings up a little search bar, just type in restrictions. It'll take you to the places that you need to be for that, uh, to be able to look that up. So uh, that's one way that you can do it. There's also a tons of safeguards already on your phone through uh, screen time. And that's also in your settings. So if you hit uh, the settings tab, uh, it takes you to a place where you can actually look at the screen time, which is what I went to a while ago um, to do that. So you hit settings, you go down, and this is, updated, you know, if your phone's not been updated for a while, uh, then maybe you may not have that option. But uh, if it's been updated recently, you have uh, that on there. And so like on here, it says how long I've been viewing, um, looking at my phone today. It breaks down social networking, entertainment, reading and reference, uh, etc. So there's tabs that it tells you how long I've spent doing each one of those, which are super, super helpful. But uh, there's things that you can do. There's downtime that you can schedule uh, time away from the screen. All right, you can schedule that on there. Uh, There's app limits. You can set time limits for apps, uh, how long they can view it. Uh, Always allow apps that you want at all times. All right, so if like, you're like, well, I need to be able to talk to my kid or whatever, that's fine. Like, you don't have don't deal with that. Turn off the other apps. Uh, there's certain apps that you can keep on at all times. And then there's content and privacy restrictions. Uh, that's also a part of that um, as well. And so there's tons of things that you can do. And like I said, a quick Google search, uh, it will get you a long ways down the road with that, that you can, you can do that. Like that's not, uh, not beyond your, 
Technology can be intimidating, but that's not too far beyond. You can totally, totally figure those things out very easily and, and will help your student out a ton, uh, especially early on. The other um, resource that I would suggest is another paid one. So that's all free that comes on your device already. But one paid one that I would uh, suggest maybe using if you would, uh, if you feel like you need it is a thing called Covenant Eyes. Uh, and so very uh, it it's, has its own browser that they can use to search through. Um, it tells you where they've gone, uh, what they've looked at, what they've searched, all those types of things as they go through it. But it is paid monthly subscription. Um, also, if you just want to hop on their site, there's tons of resources, uh, things that you can find, that you can look up, uh, things that you can, can talk to your kid about, ways that you can engage with them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 That's awesome. So, um, so that those are some things, you know, practical things, the Disney Circle, um, all of those things that that can help um, in this. And so, those are all guardrails, safeguards that you can put in place. The biggest thing uh, is having that conversation and dealing with those things as they come. And so, um, obviously, there are tons of of things that we could talk about. Like I said, this is more of an entry into uh, this arena, but, but is there any questions that maybe you have specifically that you were thinking, uh, man, I, I wonder about, and I'll try to answer it. I may not be able to answer it, but I can try to. <laughs> We've talked to them, uh, not quite to this extent, but, but just around those issues. For sure. I do want to say, because I think it's sometimes misleading, um, that even things that are set up for kids, like YouTube kids or something, I think parents have like a false sense of security sometimes that those things are completely filtering everything. And from what I've seen, that's not necessarily true. So I don't, I don't know if other people want to get the answer to you yeah, I mean, it's the same thing as, like I was saying, driving down the road with the, with the magazine on the side of the road is that um, people, are, people are planting things in there. You know, they plant things in there all the time. Uh, I'll search things for, for church, you know, like looking for an image about a backdrop or whatever, and all of a sudden it's like, what in the world am I doing here, <laughs> you know, uh, that there's something that pops up on the screen, and it's like, that has nothing to do with anything that I'm, t- that I'm looking for. Uh, I was looking for a canvas, you know, <laughs> like, not that. Um, but, but what are some, some other questions you may have? What apps, like, for phones, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Snapchat's a, 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 a huge one. Yes, uh, it is a big one. Instagram is um, deceptively uh, scary as well um, because of the Explorer tab that's in there. Um, you can hit the little Explore and see things that are going around you, things that other people have liked, uh, whatever, and, and all of a sudden something will pop up. So, like, I'm a big fisherman. Ah, I'm a big fisherman. I do a lot of fishing. I post fishing pictures, uh, and then I get into the search tab, and the pictures of people fishing I've never fished with before in my life. All right? Like, they're wearing what they're not wearing, and, and, and yes. And it's like, what? <laughs> like, I don't, I don't, but that's how easy it is, how easy it is. And as a 13, 14-year-old kid, you're like, all right, yeah. Um, so the search tab in Instagram is, is huge. And then um, anything that they can direct message in um, is is got elements to it. Um, WhatsApp um, is, is one that people use, group me, any, anything that they can get into a, a group text messaging thing, um, <clears throat> and someone's maybe there who uh, they don't want to be there, or they've st- started something at some point, uh, it can be like a piranha attack, you know, and they just start all jumping in there and beating up on someone, and, and it can really mess them up, you know, in their heart in that. And so, you know, 
pretty much any app that involves a networking of any kind has some element of danger to it uh, just because of the nature of them. Well, YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. YouTube uh, as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And so anything like that could be, could be a dangerous situation. And, and that's why uh, we're talking about what we are. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the second that my, I think my daughter was nine at the time, and I actually was sitting right beside me on the iPad and building something, and all of a sudden I saw all of the little heads of the images, there would be little chat boxes, and there was horrible conversations <laughs> happening that she, when she came to she didn't even have to hold it was inside, I was like, that's it, that's mm-hmm. what she is, and so. Yeah. Roadblocks, is that what you Roadblocks, Something like that, yeah. Hey, that's not bad. Yeah. That's not bad at all. Um, yeah. When you do the restrictions on your phone, you can't set the restrictions up for like on search engines. You mm-hmm. can set it to where it'll block out bad words or mm-hmm. you can't do that with Instagram or any of those where you put restrictions on I, I don't think so. I don't think so. Yeah, that. That's uh, that, that's that's the issue is that uh, all of these devices and all of these uh, apps are actually created to keep you on them longer. Like, like, and so that's 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 what they're selling. <laughs> that's what they're trying to do. And so uh, that's their objective. At the end of the day, you can get on Facebook and scroll for hours. You know, easily they make it as easy as they can for you to be there and to keep you there and to, to keep you coming back there. And so that's what they're trying to sell. And so we have to find <clears throat> that balance that's there. One question that, that maybe you have um, that, that I'll just hit on real quick here is what if my kid's already um, involved with pornography, already struggling with pornography, that's already something that's there. What's the, the next step uh, for them? And the big thing is, you know, the amount uh, that's going on. So if I have a student who comes to me and says, hey, I'm struggling with pornography, uh, usually my initial thing uh, to tell them is to give up their phone uh, for them not to have it, a- any device that they have for an extended period of time. Um, and at first they're, probably, they're like, what? what do you mean? Like, well, I thought we could be like an accountability group or whatever. Uh, but uh, I think that, that the, the best thing that can happen is it's just like anything else. You know, if you, you find someone who's wanting to quit smoking or whatever it is, uh, the cold turkey is, is 
just the best way. You can do it without, absolutely, but, but immediately cutting off all of that access, uh, it needs to happen because they're going to try to find it, <laughs> right? They're going to try to find a loophole around it, even if you put restrictions on it. If that's something that they're really dealing with, then they're going to try and find the way to get some access to it in some format. And so to completely, uh, as uh, John Owen, a good Puritan says, uh, to starve it out. Uh, the, the best way to kill uh, sin in our life is to starve it. And the way that we do that is by not feeding it with anything that's there. So we have to get rid of those things. So that would be my first step in whatever that is. If your kid's struggling with some of those things uh, is to take it all away and it'll seem extreme, but then slowly start to bring it back and check up, have the restrictions, have the things that are there, uh, but slowly give some access over time. And, uh, and be willing to take it again uh, if, if you need to. But uh, it, they, will, they will thank you for it. They'll hate you for it at the beginning. Uh, but they'll thank you for it later on uh, whenever they start to understand, hey, I wasn't ready <laughs> for that, uh, to have that there. And so uh, anything else? What about the search engines, Google mm -hmm. and some of those, you know? I mean, right. they'll actually you know, take you anywhere. Yes. Yeah, they will. And Sometimes even, and we don't even know what Google knows about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, there's yeah. Restrictions on the iPhones to those, those sites. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. I've, I've been trying to look for like an appliance, and for whatever reason, some of the names of the companies, it's like it's restricted. And I'm like, what is wrong? <laughs> you know, but I have my restrictions on my own phone. Oh. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, that's another yeah. example would be to your kids. Yeah. Is Absolutely. Yeah. I think that's the worst place as a parent. I think we're all here because we know our kids mm -hmm. are, are fully capable. But I think yeah. too many parents try to think, well, my kid would never do that. <laughs> right. And, and I think at least we're going in with eyes wide open. So yeah. We won't be blindsided. And a good way to start a conversation that's uncomfortable is to say, and I've done this with my kids, this is going to be awkward. Like, I start the conversation with that. <laughs> and the kids seem to kind of disarm it. It's really good because they know, like, mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> this is awkward too, you know? yeah. And I think it's a disarming way to say, hey, this might be a little uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Let me have some conversations. So. Yeah. One yeah, area absolutely. Area, um, is Parker was doing research for a paper for our homeschool co op, and he was looking for like a Roman emperor or something. And I can't remember what it was that he typed in, but it was completely innocent. And he came running into the kitchen. <laughs> <laughs> but right. he was freaked out by it because I was like, okay, so for right now, be quiet. But, mm -hmm. you know, the fact that he was searching for a research paper yeah. and there it was, and mm -hmm. it broke my heart. Like, I Absolutely. I was trying that here was, you know, mm -hmm. he's trying to look for something for a paper. Yeah. And I was like, see, what are you <laughs> Right. But, you know, um, it's, it's that quick and it's that easy. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah. And so. Now all the schools are using Google Pads or iPads. And and that that is that is definitely an, an issue as well. Yeah. You can't set it on your search engines for them to have to have a password that puts them on. Like you can make it to where they have to hand you their phone and you type in the code and then click on everything. So. Mm -hmm. that's yeah. Yeah, what, what was that under? Uh, I just, I'm, I don't know exactly where you, if you need it, I can find it and dig it up. But I okay. know that, I, mean, I know guys that have it on their phone and they hand it to their wives and they yeah. type in the code. Hey, yeah, and I would just say this, this is, this is completely free. Uh, you, don't have, you don't have to pay for this. Uh, is uh, ha have a policy where you and your wife are exchanging your phones and giving free access to that. The, the, do it. 
do it. It's, there's no, uh, I say there's no reason not to. There's a reason not to. I hope there's not a reason <laughs> not to. Uh, you know, to, to just do it, man. Let your kids see you do it. All right, let the, make it a big deal. Like, like do it right in front of them so they see uh, that that's something that's going on because it can happen anytime and anywhere. All right, yeah. So a lot of these browsers, they have incognito mode. Yep. These kids know about that. Yes. Mm-hmm. So that's another reason to find an app. Yeah. Whether it's coming out other things like that, they can mm-hmm. eliminate that and mm-hmm. block out Safari and block things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, like I said, obviously there is, we could talk about this uh, all day and and numerous times, um, and and hopefully this will be something that we revisit different components of uh, these issues in the future. Um, But uh, thank you guys for being here. If you have any questions uh, that you want to ask me personally, or or Connor, you know, Connor's a young guy. He, uh, he's... He, uh, he knows all about the interwebs. Uh, he grew up with it. <laughs> that uh, He might be able to find some tricks and things that, that can help you out as well. But uh, please let us know. All right? Thank you, guys. Cool.